Good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Hong Nguyen. I'm the faculty in Triple E NTU Singapore. I'm going to talk about Gaussian process learning for power systems. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizer of Second Symposium on Machine Learning and Dynamical Systems to give us the chance to share our work in this platform. And uh, I would like to take a minute to introduce the people in my group working on the Gaussian process. So first of all, about myself, I am a power engineer by training. I'm working on different problems in power systems, mostly from the aspect of uh, computational and uh, application in uh, operation and control. Uh, then we have the former research panel, Dr. Chao Zai. He's currently the professor in China University of Geoscience. And we have the third year PhD, uh, Patrick Perrick. He's a driver of many work in our group. And uh, for today talk, uh, we start with some background and specific problems that we entered in power systems. Uh, then we move to Gaussian process learning. Uh, then we focus on two main uh, problems. The first one is uh, equilibrium behavior, or it has under name the path row. Uh, then the second problem is the stability of a system. And for both the equilibrium behavior and the stability problems, we consider under uncertainties. Then I will conclude the talk with unsolved and open questions. All right, so let's start with some basic of uh, power systems. And uh, we all know that power system is a critical infrastructure among power, gas, and water that delivers the power to the end users. And a, a typical power system consists of three components. We have generation, we have transmission and diffusion system, and we have the end user or the load. So first, power is generated in power plant. So let's say that it's from thermal power plant, uh, then it transmits through the line the long transmission line and the low voltage different system before it goes to the end user or individual house. So in terms of uh, mathematical model, we can use the differential algebraic equations or DAE to represent and uh, model our power systems. Uh, so a DAE consists of two set of equations. So first of all is uh, differential relation. And let's start with some state x where the state chain over time, x dot equal the f of x and y. So y here, they are algebraic variables. So besides the uh, uh, dynamical equations, uh, it also has uh, algebraic relation, which, which tells us the behavior over the network. So again, the first dynamical equations that is describes the dynamic uh, behavior of a component. So say like uh, generators or or the load side, and the second set of set equations, the uh, algebraic relation tell us about the relationship to mostly to the network. For example, the Kirchhoff law or the power conservation law. Uh, in power system, both the function f and g they are nonlinear. Uh, then from that we can say the power system is a nonlinear dynamical systems. And among the other things, the equilibrium behavior of nonlinear dynamical system is important. Uh, then uh, to find the equilibrium of the power systems, what we can do is that we set the changing, um, the changing of the diagonal state is to zero. Then we have the two sets of algebraic relation, f and g. And in a more compact form, we have the capital F f and g equals zero. The equilibrium behavior in power system has other name, the power flow problems. Then the power flow problem in power system represents the power conservation law that written for every single bus in a power system. And a bus here, for example, is we have the bus I, is a point when I collect different components such as generators or the transmission line. Then the power flow equation is written for a bus I is have following form. It's the total power going in, PI as equals the total power going out to the x line. For example, uh, the line ij, I have the pij, and for line ik, I have the pik. Then the power flow when written is this form. The power going in to the bus i, pi, equals the total power going out from that bus, and in terms of voltage v. In more complex form, we have the input, 
P is a vector of the own position as the own buses equals the sum function of the voltage V. So here we can define as the P as the input and the voltage V as the output. So now the important thing to note that the set of equation in function F, they are nonlinear. And that brings to different uh, below characteristic of the power flow equations. So first of all, for a given uh, injection P, we can use the iterative method such as Newton option to find the solution V. Uh, another thing is that for a given value of injection P, we may have more than one, sol one solution of voltage. So in this case, we have multiple solutions. And, and the last uh, characteristic is that the solution manifolds may have very complex form, uh, the non-convex and difficult to construct. So let's look at from the right hand side, we have the shape of power flow solution space in 3D for very simple, for very simple systems. And you can see that uh, the set of solutions can be like a donut shape, or they have the three sets that are discolated. The non-linearity nature of the power flow brings a lot of difficulty and challenges in uh, understanding, solving, and characterizing the solution of power flow. But on top of that, we also have need to deal with input uncertainties. So let's take a look again at the power flow relations. So here we have the power input P as a nonlinear function of the output voltage V. Uh, then the input P, in fact, it can be uncertain due to several reasons. So uh, first of all is the iteration of the variable generation. And we know that, for example, in terms of the sonar panels and the output depending on the weather pattern, uh, or in other case, we have the exit vehicles in the grid, uh, then the charging and discharging patterns also depend on the weather. Uh, then in fact that uh, depending on where the uncertainty come from, the uncertain input may have different distribution and different form. For, for example, if the input P comes from a rebel generation, then the distribution of the input P may, uh, may be affected by the weather pattern. So now, interesting uh, problem that we want to answer is that how the power flow solution will behave under such uncertainties. And in fact, the output dependencies on the input uncertainty is very difficult to characterize due to the non nature of the power flow equations. And so that we don't have any explicit form or relationship that we can use to represent the equilibrium voltage V in terms of the input P. And the problem that uh, we need to solve in this case is the inverse power flow. So when we're talking about the inverse power flow, let's step uh, back a bit, scroll back a bit to consider the more simple case, which is a deterministic case. So in this case, the input um, may change, but depending on some fixed parameters and through our nonlinear model. So in this case, uh, nonlinear power flow. And from that, we have some nonlinear output. And this nonlinear output also is rather difficult to characterize even in the case of deterministic. So now we make the problem even more complicated when we have the uncertain input. And to the, our same nonlinear model, we want to characterize the output in terms of uncertain input. And uh, we need to provide some statical information, for example, the mean and variation. And these problems is a typical class of uncertainty quantification. Several issues here to bring up is first of all, the, our models are nonlinear. Then we don't have the explicit form that you to represent uh, the output in terms of the input. And uh, in a lot of cases, uh, that the information of the input is not enough. And we don't have a good form of even like, the input distribution. Uh, then the last problem that ha happens in a uh, system is with the size and with the dimensions. So um, the one typical large scale power system may consist of uh, thousands or millions of variables. So in this case, we, uh, and any, any problem will become uh, more difficult because uh, mostly we need to deal with the large scale of the data. 
Among other learning methods, we use the Gaussian process and it is a Bayesian framework uh, and uh, more importantly, it is a non-parametric and interpretable modeling tool. By uh, non-parametric meaning that we don't aim to use any finite set of parameters to uh, fit a given set of data and by interpretable meaning that uh, we understand why we have certain output uh, for a given input and if something wrong with the output and we can know why that happens. Okay, so at Israel we start with the training set or, or the training data and in this case we have the set D and we have some some input x and the corresponding y put y uh, and in this case we have n number of samples all right so i will explain what what mean by the y hat here uh, and uh, for our work we use the gaussian learning model have for, for inform so let's say that we have some uh, non-linear relationship is a y as a function of x so the output as function of the input and this is the two function that uh, we want to to learn and we want to understand and because of the function itself is nonlinear, and then most likely we wouldn't have the exact value of the output, but instead we can have the numerical observation. For example, we use Newton Raphson to solve power flow, uh, then we can find the voltage uh, solution. So that voltage solution is a numerical solution, and is uh, we use y hat to represent it. And uh, there are gap between the actual the actual output and the numerical observation that is uh, numerical error so this is a numerical error and uh, we further assume this numerical error is following the Gaussians okay now uh, so this is interesting point that make it make our model is different from the other context uh, where the people use Gaussian process uh, is that in our models so I mean in this function this function is deterministic and have no uncertainty here. Uh, and we know everything about this function. Right? Uh, but the only thing that uh, we don't know is actually the output for a given some for some given uh, input so that we uh, we can contain the numerical errors epsilon. Alright. So after we fix the Korean function or the code OK, uh, then very nice property of the Gaussian process learning is that we have the analytic or expression of the mean and variance. So we have the mean and we have the variance here. We use Gaussian process to learn the inverse power problem. So in particular, we learn the relationship between the output voltage V and the input P. So from the right side, you see that there's some kernel function K and the input P as argument. And we also have some uh, coefficient alpha. So the alpha is concerned upon learning and uh, for a given data set, as well as uh, the kernel function and alpha is constant. So the relationship between the voltage and the power will be represented by the kernel function. Uh, then the choice of kernel functions must need to balance the accuracy and the complexity. Um, so in this case, in our work, we use three types of kernels, and you can use more different type of kernels, but here we use three type of kernels. So the first type is a polynomial kernels with uh, degree n. Uh, so the form of the kernel is the following thing. It looks a bit complicated, but it has uh, two hyperparameters, tau and l. And the important here is uh, we look at the number n, the degree n. So when n equal 1, we have the, the linear form, or n equal 2, we have the quadratic form, and so on. Uh, then we also have the square exponential kernel and also have the rational quadratic kernel. So regardless of the choice of the kernel function, and there are some features of the Gaussian process uh, that uh, is worth to uh, highlight here. So first of all, uh, we can use the Gaussian process to approximate uh, the function and also evaluate over a space of state instead of uh, a point. So to make this point clear, to make point clear, we we can consider as a linearization that people mostly use for any function. So we will need to choose the uh, equilibrium and uh, linearize around that equilibrium. So mostly the linearization evaluate around a point, uh, but different from linearization. We, but when we use the Gaussian process and the approximation if I need over a space. And the second point is that 
we do not use a finite set of the parameters to fit the data. But here we we understand and we learn the the whole family of function, and also uh, the next thing is that uh, the uh, variance can be used as an indicator for the accuracy. So um, meaning that if the variance is small, and that mean we can learn the function better or the or the variance is large, and that mean the error is high. Uh, also, the last thing is uh, again the interpretability. So in this one, uh, when we look at the results, so mostly we know why that happened and why why we have such kind of uh, results. Okay, now let's go to the numerical simulations. Uh, here we have uh, different three columns, and uh, the first one is the power system that we use as a test case. And in this case, we have the three, 33 bar system, and we have the 56 OH and uh, another 56 for EG. And uh, we have the uh, uh, narrow of confidence. Uh, and from this big column, we have uh, we check different kernel and to see the uh, error for each kernel to be better. Uh, then we have the bow number here. They actually represent the smallest error. Uh, so in other words, it's saying that uh, the corresponding kernel should be the best uh, for different system. For example, like the thirty-three bus and fifty-six and the a kernel with a rational quantity form is will be the best. The use of Gaussian process in the input loop flow bring a new perspective to a more important problems, which is a probabilistic input loop flow. So first of all, this method is non-parametric, meaning that we don't use a finite number of parameters to uh, fit the data, and also uh, it works for any class of uncertainty distribution of the input. Uh, so in this sense, uh, we don't require any form of the input so that uh, we can make the probabilistic input power flow accordingly, uh, but uh, the input may have any form. And the second point is that by choosing the different kernels, we can capture the non nits in a different degree of the power flow equations. Uh, then uh, the Gaussian Bay uh, probabilistic input power flow will have two steps. Uh, the first step is the learning step. When we use the Gaussian process, we derive some semi-explicit form of the uh, power flow solutions and uh, based, based on the form of the kernel. And the second step is the testing phase. Uh, so in this in this step, we derive the statical information of the solution. For example, the mean and uh, variation. All right. So the last point is uh, we develop the a new way to sample the data via the GPUCB method. So it is a sampling scheme uh, to tell us the optimal way how to uh, choose the sample points. Uh, and we can have the very good results by using the Gaussian process. Uh, so for example, in this case, we see that we use a relative error and uh, is rather very small uh, with the small number of the sampling points and uh, very fast so all right so here uh, we have some figures that showing the relationship uh, of the power and the voltage so which is uh, we have the name for this is uh, no scope uh, so here we have the x acid is a power and the y axis is a voltage so because of the system may have the more than one node uh, so, but uh, we don't pay attention to the number here. It's just that here we have some the power injection at some point, and we have the voltage at the other point. And the curve that we plot in this case is we have the name for it is a nose curve. All right. So here we have the blue dot point. Actually, they are the training samples. Uh, so we have uh, seven of them, and we have the red dot curves. Actually, is the represent the mean uh, and uh, around that you can see the regret bound or the error so most of the time is the error is quite good up to the p equal 40 and it getting larger and larger when the, the input power get, getting big uh, so in this case you can see that uh, the using Gaussian process can approximate the load flow curve or the nose curve is very good uh, 
uh, and it covers a big portion of the TV uh, relationship. So far, we talk about the power flow solution or the uh, equilibrium behavior. And the equilibrium behavior is a fundamental problem to power system, but it's not enough. Uh, as mostly the system will be subject to even a small or large disturbances that drive system away from the equilibrium. And the question now is that can the system return to the uh, a good equilibrium, either like the original equilibrium or another equilibrium? So first of all, in this case, uh, when system is lying at uh, staying at the one equilibrium zero, and the state uh, after disturbance state may vary and uh, uh, have the oscillation. And the desirable behavior is that the oscillation will decay and finally the system return to the original equilibrium. And we also have also the bad case when the oscillation getting larger and larger. And uh, for some kind of non stability, uh, we link to uh, some even minor or the major breakout in the system and may, le may lead to a tremendous uh, economic loss. So this is important to understand whether the system is um, stable or not. And we use a small signal stability to differentiate with a different case of stability, which is large uh, disturbance stability. Uh, but in this work, we only talk about small signal stability, that is ability of the system when it becomes stable, subject to small disturbances, or, or the perturbation about the uh, one equilibrium. So in order to answer this question, whether the system is small signal stability, what we need to do is uh, we need to linearize the nonlinear differential algebraic equation. And we will come to a set of the linearized in, in this form. And here we have the A, B, C, D as a constant matrix and evaluated at the equilibrium that we consider. Uh, then uh, what we need to do is that uh, we need to eliminate the algebraic variable delta y. So and then we replace that into the first uh, differential equation, and we can come up with the reduced Jacobian jr equal a minus b d inverse c. Uh, then the condition, the sufficient and, and necessary and sufficient condition for system to be small signal. Stability is that the maximum real part of all eigenvalues of Jacobian is less than zero. So, in other words, all eigenvalues of the reduced Jacobian will stay at the Nepa plane. So, the Nepa, the net part of the imagined axis in this case. And uh, in case the system is, uh, is not small signal stable, and then we have some eigenvalues lying at the right hand side for the, in this case. Right. So the, the problem is uh, is that the behavior of the eigenvalues depending on the state are very difficult to characterize. Uh, and uh, especially for the small signal stability, what we need to understand is that not all the eigenvalues, but the critical eigenvalues, which is uh, uh, is the one Algebraic or the pair of algebraic which is closest to the uh, imaginary axis from the left hand side. All right. So uh, the traditional methods um, work in this way. So let's say that we have a space, and in this space we may have uh, many equilibrium or many equilibria like in this. Uh, so the problems of small snobility. Uh, in this space is that we need to check one by one uh, when the equilibrium chain from, from one to the other so we need to mostly to recompute the cross and uh, and to compute as a to assess whether the system is stable or not and for, for, for this uh, matters is actually uh, if we want to stand the own if we are in some space so the uh, we call it eigenvalue based approaches and this approach is rather non-convex and also valid at um, a single equilibrium uh, then it's uh, very difficult to generalize to, to any uh, space or subspace uh, then also we need to do the expensive uh, uh, matrix inversion is uh, when we need to inverse the D matrix to obtain the reduced 
uh, job pain. So, so this this study will cause some compute, uh, computational burden. All right, uh, and also it certainly is not possible if we have a large number of equilibria within some the space the space that we want to understand. Um, then uh, another also thing is that uh, while most of the eigenvalue based approach, uh, we both try to understand the behavior of the critical eigenvalues, but or around some some neighborhood, but this relationship of BV here is uh, is very difficult and challenging in characterizing that. Uh, so in this work, uh, what we what we do is that uh, we will learn the dependencies of critical eigenvalues, um, how it behave given in uh, some given some state space, uh, and we uh, develop some certificate so that uh, uh, to assess the small signality of a system within the space. So remember this is uh, uh, stability behavior in a whole space, uh, not only at a single point. So this is now we introduce a new framework to assess the stability of the system within a subspace uh, and we call it probabilistic robust stability. So here we have two terms, probabilistic and robust, where we use with stability. So first of all, for the robust stability, that is the characteristic saying that for a given subspace, the system will be stable for all equilibria within the subspace, 100% small signal stability with all the equilibria exist in the subspace and for the probabilistic stabilities meaning that for a given equilibrium and with which probability the system will stable at that point and we combine the two uh, terminology and we call it a new one probabilistic robust stability to saying that for a given uh, subspace of uh, inside the state space and with which probability the system is robust stable all right. So and here we uh, we define the probabilistic robust stability space uh, as the system is stable for the own inner point with at least a given level of confidence. So the way we do is that is uh, we use the probabilistic robust stability certificate is like this. So we will learn the maximum of the real path of critical eigenvalues. And if this maximum real part of critical eigenvalues news within that subspace, net cause this is the PM, and depending on the state act and the delta, with the one delta is the probability. And if this maximum real part of critical eigenvalues news is not zero, means that the system is uh, robust, stable within the considered subspace, with the probability is one minus delta. When delta is uh, a positive number between 1 and 0 and of course uh, we use this uh, maximum uh, what the maximum critical eigenvalues value the real part of the values using Gaussian process uh, all right so for, uh, for example in uh, in this case let's look at the figures so in, uh, here we have the two parameters uh, p at the generator, third generator and also the reactive power at the third generators and the, the space that we consider is actually the rectangular space uh, it's like this and around the consider the equilibrium uh, and uh, what we want to answer is that whether the systems will be stable robust stable within this space all right so and we need to have the other uh, probabilistic robust stability framework is that uh, if the maximum of the real part of by and values within such space is less than zero so meaning that we can conclude that the certificate is certified meaning and so the system is probabilistic robust stable in such a space with the control level is one minor delta okay now what happens if, uh, if this condition is not certified meaning that the uh, maximum of the real part of critical eigen value is uh, less than zero so in this case whether we need to reduce the space that, that we consider or we change the confidence level. All right, so coming back to the example that we consider right here, uh, and and in fact that the whole the whole regular space is not uh, probabilistic, robust, stable. 
so what we need to do is that we need to reduce the space into this uh, into this blue region why why we keep the complete level then in this uh, new region uh, here the system is uh, provided robust stable so now that uh, i move to the last part of the talk uh, when i introduce the unsolved and the open questions uh, for the gaussian process application as well as the other machine learning type uh, in Parsonson. so first of all that is a problem of the dimensions so um, the thing is that the power system may consist of a huge number of variables. So in this case, we may have an, a large number of the data points. And the, the fact that the Gaussian process may scale very badly with the data ensemble uh, with the cubic complexity. Uh, and uh, while the power system may need a very large number of samples, n, and so mostly it's impossible to use of the shell Gaussian process tool to apply to the large scale uh, power systems. So the future work we need to deal with the scalability of the Gaussian process. And uh, another problem with uh, the kind of learning methods is that the interpretability and the explainability. Uh, to understand what really happened inside the learning algorithms, to explain why we receive the output and uh, if there's something wrong with, with the output result or the function that we learn uh, then how we can fix that. All right. Uh, then other point is that we also can uh, develop the causality analysis of the learning features with the physical parameters and the state of system. So this point is uh, important, and uh, that link to the uh, physics informed machine learning or the or the Gaussian process learning is that uh, we have a very good understanding of the physical system. Um, for some system that we did not for uh, several hundred years. Uh, and, and now with the power of the machine learning or, or Gaussian process learning is that whether we can leverage our understanding into the physical system that, uh, that we know and we use that to maybe the speed up or the, we verify the solution or the output of any machine learning algorithms. Then there are some reference uh, for, for this talk, uh, for the two work, the one, the first one is uh, probabilistic load flow that using the Gaussian process learning and this one available to archive and the other papers that's on the probabilistic robust small signal stability uh, using Gaussian process. So this work is uh, presented at the PSCC 2020 and also available to the Electric Power System Research Journal. So this talk focus on the Gaussian learning methods for power systems. And thank you for your attention. And uh, for any questions you may have, please email to myself at uh, hung at uh, ntu and ng and also my student, Patrick Perry. Thank you and stay safe.